Hey everybody, it's Josh. Every time we get into a shallow, lustful relationship, we're searching for God. Every time we get to the end of a whiskey or pill bottle, we're searching for God. You know, it's pouring down rain out here. It's been flooding in the area, so I had to do these videos in my truck again. It reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount when Christ said, when the rains pour down and the creeks rise and the wind is pounding against you and against your house, the foundation of rock that the house was built upon is the one that will remain standing. The foundation of sand is the one that will crumble easily. For those who believe and follow his teachings, build their house upon rock. Those who stray from him, build their house upon the sand. No matter how we try to escape the harsh realities of our life, it is like we are searching for loving hands to catch us during our free fall. In reality, we are just prolonging the fall hitting every jagged rock along the way. We make ourselves miserable. We turn our backs to God. Often, we're so smug and arrogant, we would never consider lowering ourselves to the likes of those brainwashed believers. I know that's how I was, was before I was saved. I've mentioned before that I didn't want to find the Christian God. I wanted to find whatever was the truth, but in reality it was my ego driving me and I wanted to make God into whatever I thought was convenient for me. But <clears throat> I stayed true. I surrendered myself to his truth. Christ says he's the way and the truth and the life. The truth is undeniable. We can't change God to make him whatever we feel like making him. There are sins we don't agree with. We often just conform God to whatever is absent of that sin. We'll get some, I got some notes here today. I was repeatedly, repeatedly uh, raising the point with atheists that believers are much happier in life. This is what they don't seem to understand. We are, we are called delusional. We are called just uh, cultists. We are called every name in the book because atheists want to make God or whatever they're substituting for God into what is convenient for them. But when we get older, we start learning that life is not going to conform to us. God is not going to conform to us. We swim so fast and hard against the current trying to make it this way but yet it always turns out the same the truth is the truth no matter how hard we try maybe we find later in life that we don't we have a boss that doesn't respect us we find that we have loved ones who fail us or abandon us the foundations start to crack when we see the elders of our family dying off one by one, and each time it's like a claw mark on our soul. Many of my friends dealt with the confrontation of their own morality in different ways. Even before, even the supposed quarter life crisis, when you go from being a carefree teen to finally having 
some sort of responsibility in life. You finally have to get out and start making a way of your own. But my friends would always do things like, I had one friend who would buy a new car every single time he went through some big crisis in his life. And he would just drive around like he was trying to recapture those days of being a carefree teen again. When all he cared about was partying and girls and drugs and alcohol. He worshipped at the altar of self. The hedonistic way. But a midlife crisis is a much deeper existential weight we must hoist upon our shoulders. We feel like Atlas carrying the world. When we're so young and strong, it's a much easier task. But as Bob Dylan wrote in one of his great songs, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. When talking about how passionate he would get about the injustices of the world. What you come to find out is that the injustices are hiding around every corner. We work to solve one and two more pop up. Many of the policies we demand our government make because of injustice actually only makes it worse. We start worshiping these protests and passions And it is just a grain of sand trying to fill a God-sized void within us. As the passions turn to spite and the weight of the world pushes us waist deep in the dirt, the crisis intensifies. We reach for the bottle or stoke the flames of lust. Anything to make the hurt go away. Everything we reach starts to crumble violently we finally see the cost of our emptiness often we do the same thing over and over again expecting different results sometimes for decades often for decades if we go by what the happiness chart says studying the happiness by age we put on different disguises to hide our desecrated self It becomes so monotonous, it's like being a prisoner beating their head against the prison cell bars. This is a crucible many of us must traverse to find our salvation. It wasn't until I felt the comfort of God's grace that I ever began to open my eyes. I always looked down on the devout, partially because I envied their faith, and partially because I didn't believe they truly had any. Far too many I encountered have confirmed their false faith, like a virtue signal to show how much more important God thinks they are, the holier-than-thou feeling. But then I realized that some of them truly had found the secret to life, true meaning and purpose, through the unconditional love of Christ. When you truly feel the presence of God you suddenly understand that you've been living in hell for far too long. But you never have to go back again. I never had a fear of hell when I lived with my back turned to God. I felt that I had been deceived and that hell was most likely likely a deception too. Then I realized that hell was what I'd turned my life into. Christ tells us that hell is being separated from God. No one is sent to hell. It is a place we choose freely. God is waiting there with open arms to avert our gaze for so long that we forget to look in his direction. We don't even think it's an option anymore. We trudge stubbornly into the tangled webs of sin and spite. As we become increasingly more trapped, Our sanity, peace, and joy is twisted and torn until nothing but emptiness is left. I've often said that we have to be completely broken before we can be born again. 
While this is not true of all, it was certainly true for me. There is something about rock bottom that gives us freedom. We have nothing left to lose, and the darkness is the perfect place to see the light. So many of us are lost and alone. In this fallen world, it happens at almost every age. But there is always salvation just a prayer away. I know it sounds way too easy, but the prayer must be genuine. There must be no desperation or motives, only a desire to have an intimate relationship with God. Getting to midlife is when most of us crumble. It is, studies have shown it is rock bottom for the majority of us. As I said, we see the elders dying off. Sometimes we have to hold the hands of our parents as they suffer through cancer, dementia, stroke, whatever. And oftentimes our parents are the only foundation of, in our life, the only rock solid constant that we've ever known because we haven't put our faith in God. So when they die off, it is all thrown upon our shoulders and we already have the weight of the world on there. We just buckle and get crushed beneath the weight. I understand that Atheists and non-believers, people of other religions who just feel like there's some sort of works and, and no relationship with their God, no understanding their God, no intimate connection. They feel like we are so, well, just so dumb, like I said, delusional. I understand. It, it, it does seem delusional in a way to believe in some imaginary being is, is what they call the sky daddy or the spaghetti monster or whatever condescending term they use. It all seems like it's just a fantasy made up just to help us cope with life. And I get it. <clears throat> there are many religions that are like this. You know, I think of mythology, you know, I'm, the most famous is probably Greek mythology, Roman mythology. We look at their coping mechanism, <clears throat> but it really isn't a way to cope if you look at the results of what the Greeks and Romans evolved into. They don't have that morality that comes straight from God. They have a pantheon of gods that they created to describe natural phenomenon or feeling. You know, they had the God of love, the God of war, the God of harvest. Every single thing you could think of a lot of the religions have a God for that. That is what is an imaginary creation to cope. Christ was a living man, a historical man, who told us and most importantly showed us he was God. He gave us that example to live by. He told us in the Sermon on the Mount that believing in him is a foundation of rock. So the winds and the waters and whatever suffering and struggles in life will never shake us. Will never break us at least. We'll get shaken. Um, I, I misquoted that. <clears throat> we will absolutely get shaken. 
And when we doubt is when we sin. Because every time we sin, it is doubting God. Because if we believed fully and we put our faith completely in him, we would never, ever put that suffering upon our own Lord and Savior. But we cannot be perfect. We are always plagued by doubts. We are always plagued by desire. And during our midlife crisis, we are confronted with so many things. It is a time when we either find ourselves or we are just going to die miserable, awful people. Now, I'm not saying that all atheists are awful people. I know some of them try to be good people. They try mainly because they want to show us dumb religious people just how great they can be. But they are missing the ultimate hope. They are missing the foundation of rock. They can survive minor tragedies and traumas with no problem. But once that foundation-shaking tragedy happens to them, they're going to crumble like a castle in the sand. I don't wish that upon anyone. I wish they would open their eyes. But they see me as lesser. They see me as someone to be laughed at, not someone to be listened to. And I don't want them to listen to me. I want them to listen to Christ. There is no denying his his divinity changed the world. It changed everything. That corrupt Roman Empire and the Greeks before them, they were changed by the ethical teachings of Christ. They were lifted by the believers in Christ around them until finally they submitted to being Christians themselves. They started the church right there in Rome. And yes, I understand there are awful people who claim to be Christians and just show how bad the, the rest of us are. Because atheists always use the worst of us as an example, or non-believers, or anyone who is trying to justify their way of life and their creation of whatever they worship. They point to the worst of us. Which is one reason why I usually have more disdain for Christians who don't act Christ-like or don't strive to be repentant and change their sinful ways. I look down on them. I don't look down on them. I have more of a problem with them than I do with atheists and non-believers. Because I can see the position of atheists and non-believers. I can understand their doubts. I understand why they think the Bible is some awful thing when they just pick and choose the couple little, a couple little verses that they don't understand or that are controversial. But when Christians who profess to be devout followers of Christ, when they start acting in horrible ways, I just, I don't have the same amount of respect for their views and their doubts. Because they are, mainly, the problem I have is they are making it worse for all of us. They are giving atheists and non-believers a hammer to bludgeon us with. 
we have to understand that during those rock bottom days of our midlife crisis, when we're all just in complete confusion and crisis, we, we have to reach for something. As I've said, the atheist writer David Foster Wallace wrote that we all worship something. And if we worship something of this world, if we worship something like money or power or lust or self, then those things will devour us. They will devour us completely. Faith in God is the only thing that matters. And unfortunately, David Foster Wallace could not bring himself to put faith in God, even though he knew that was the only way to salvation. Even though he knew that was the only way to peace and happiness. He was just so wrapped up in himself and his darkness that he just, just could not do it. He could not save his own life, so he took his own life. That is sad. Another atheist writer, Camus, he talked about how atheists, basically the only choice they had was whether to end their own life or not, because life is meaningless to them. Sure, they claim to have meaning, but it only goes so deep. When whatever they worship crumbles, they will find this out. And they will probably have their heels so far dug in that they will not be able to change. And I, I weep for them. I really do. Because I understand, and I think we all can in a way, I think most of us can look at our doubts and say, yeah, I get it. You can't put your faith in something that you can't physically see or touch. The only way you're going to sense God's presence is something beyond that sixth sense. But it is vital. If you want to get through your midlife crisis and have any semblance of hope and joy and peace, there are ways to do it, I guess, without Christ, if you get lucky. But most of us don't get lucky. And that luck is going to run out at some point in their life. At some point, they're going to come to terms with God. They're going to confront God face to face. It may be on their deathbed. It may be much earlier. It may be after they die. It's usually sometime in this life. But when you dig into to this one position that you have... And I know that sounds hypocritical coming from a Christian, but I was open. I went straight to the source. I asked God to show me the truth, to reveal the truth to me, and he did. And some of it, I didn't like what I saw because I had to change. I had to sacrifice. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to take things they take joy in in life and just get rid of them completely. Nobody wants to take their escape from this miserable fallen world and just push it out of your life. It's been so reliable for so long, so many decades. Yeah, it's not reliable anymore, but it still is there. It still is a source of comfort. I plead with all of you who still struggle with faith or still are seeking God. 
you have to push past all of the desperation, all of the doubt. And that's hard to do. You know, my doubt was was so strong because I hadn't felt God's presence in 20 years. So the times I did feel God's presence as a teen, I just claimed it was a delusion. I was like, I guess I was just delusional. Everybody else must have been right. I never really told anybody, but the people told me that God's a delusion, so I started to believe him. But when you have nothing left, when you are just ready for your life to end, but not desperate enough to take it, that's that sweet spot. That sweet, beautiful brokenness. We often get there in our midlife. Some of us get there before, some of us after. It's all relative. It doesn't matter when. There's patience and there's discipline and there's all kinds of things that go along with it. But most of all, there is brokenness. Most of all, there is suffering. We're going to have it anyway. Why not try to find a loving God who can give you relief from that suffering? Take the weight off your shoulders. All right, everybody, that's that's enough for today. I'm going to go hopefully not get too wet out here, but it is... It's been flooding pretty good around the Raleigh area, but it's better than being out in the heat, I can tell you that. I'd rather be wet than hot. <laughs> I love you all. God bless.